29. If you're able, I'd like to invite you to stand for the reading of God's Word. Thus reads the Word of the Lord. On the next day, he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who has been ahead of me, for he existed before me. I did not know him, but so that he might be manifested to Israel, I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness, saying, I have beheld the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he abided on him. And I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, The one upon whom you see the Spirit descending and abiding on him, this is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Well, we're at a high point so far in the narrative of the Gospel of John. We've heard the prologue that's from the first verse to the 18th verse. That was some kind of theological prep work that John was doing, telling us about Jesus and how he's eternally begotten. He's the light of the world. He didn't have a beginning. All of these theological truths were presented. And then as we transition from the prologue, into verse 19, we start getting into the narrative. Now John says, this is what happened. John the Baptist was on the scene. This happened. That happened. And now we reach this high point where John the Baptist in this narrative is saying, there he is. Finally, we're at the point where Christ is seen. And John the Baptist is understandably ecstatic at this moment as he sees Christ coming to him. And he says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We're very familiar with that phrase, the Lamb of God. That's uh, something that's in pop culture. That's something that's throughout the Bible. It's something that's in songs. We just sang a song about the Lamb of God. It's a common theme, not just in the Bible, but in society at large. However, there is a background to this Lamb of God imagery, this phrase that some of us might not be familiar with. Why is John saying Jesus is the Lamb of God, right? We know that the lambs had to be sacrificed in order for uh, the remission of sins, and so we know this parallel. But what I'd like to do is go a little deeper into the uh, undergirding structure for why John the Baptist and the evangelist writing this gospel use that phrase, the Lamb of God. Why did John the Baptist use that phrase, and why does John the Evangelist uh, decide to include this phrase? He could have included other things he said, but he decided to include this phrase, the Lamb of God. Well, as we began reading this book, we saw that there was this uh, contrast between light and darkness, right? In the beginning of the book, in the beginning of chapter 1, it says that Jesus Christ is the light of the world. He comes into the world, and the world does not comprehend him. And it says John the Baptist is not the light. So there's this light coming in, and it's only Christ. It's nobody else. And this light comes in to the only place where light can come in, darkness. If it's already light, you can't light the area. For light to come in, it must be dark. So the scene has been set. There's a dark landscape. And light comes into the world. Well, that's precisely the situation in the Old Testament when the Lamb was presented. If you're familiar with the Old Testament, and specifically the book of Exodus, you'll remember that the Jewish people were in bondage in Egypt. They had been brought into Egypt, and they were made slaves. They were captives to the Egyptians. They were, were given very meager amounts of food, not even wages, just food, and they had to work seven days a week. They were working constantly for Pharaoh in order to build his empire. And God raises up this man named Moses, who is 
an Israelite, however, raised by the Egyptians, and he raises up Moses, and he tells Moses, go in and set my people free. And Pharaoh, as he's receiving this message from Moses, Pharaoh says, I'm not going to set your people free. And so in order to set God's people free, and in order to demonstrate God's sovereignty, God dispenses ten plagues. And second to the last plague, the ninth plague, is the plague of darkness. The book of Exodus says it's so dark in the land of Egypt, dark over the Egyptians and the Israelites, so dark that it's as if you could reach out and touch the very darkness. It was a dark darkness, the book of Exodus says. And in the midst of this darkness, in the ninth plague, then on the heels of that darkness comes the tenth plague, the worst plague. The plague that would finally motivate Pharaoh to get rid of the Israelites, and it was the plague of death. The very spirit of death was hovering over the land of Egypt in darkness. And we read this in Exodus 12, verse 29. Now it happened at midnight that Yahweh struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who is in the dungeon and all the firstborn of the cattle. Then Pharaoh arose in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was no home where there was not someone dead. We can almost hear the cry of this entire nation being raised up in the middle of the darkness, this wailing, women screaming as they go into their children's rooms to find their firstborn children dead, house after house after house. There is none who escaped this spirit of death that swept over the land. It was a time of intense darkness and death. Well, today some of us are staring down the barrel of impending death. Others are afraid of getting cancer. Some fear civil war or riots. People fear earthquakes and fires. Many run to doctors or politicians or insurance plans in order to solve these various problems that we have. And when we do that, one plague may abate. Maybe the fire will stop. Maybe the darkness might lift. But the last plague will never lift if we only run to these creaturely helps. The last plague is death. And so we, like the Israelites in Egypt, we, like the people that John was standing near when Jesus came up, we stand in the same place in this darkness, in this land where the angel of death hovers over the land, and it inevitably produces the result of death. That's where we live. There's only two things that you can count on in life, death and taxes, right? We know that death is going to come for all of us, and this is part of the darkness. Well, that leads us to the second point. If you are a student of the Reformation, if you see there in the bolts, and the second point is post tenebras lux, which is the unofficial Latin motto of the Reformation, which means after darkness, light. There was a dark time in the Reformation where the Catholic Church was killing Christians for preaching the gospel, but after that dark period, there was the light of the gospel going forth throughout Europe and then Asia and America. Well, it's the same way in this situation. John the Baptist is in this dark and evil age where people are ignoring the light, yet light comes into the world. And that's why he is so ecstatic when he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You can sense how excited John the Baptist would be in this kind of situation. It's the same excitement that you would feel if you're an ancient Israelite in Egypt, in a place in bondage, of seeing this darkness sweeping over the land, hearing the women scream as their children die, seeing fathers running out in the street with perplexed, anxious looks on their faces because there's nothing they can do to protect their children. Yet, someone brings into the room the Paschal Lamb, the Lamb of God, the Passover Lamb. 
And when the lamb is brought into the room and its blood is spread across the doorposts, peace enters the house. And all those who dwell in the house know that death will not come into this room. Life will be the result because of the death of the lamb. Well, this darkness that prevented people from accessing the lamb, this darkness is present in the people who are speaking to John. The Jewish people send the uh, priests and the Levites and their Pharisees. They, they come and they ask John these questions. Who are you? What are you doing? Why are you baptizing? And as we read in this story, they do not comprehend the light. They don't become Christians. They don't say Jesus is the Lamb. They remain in the darkness. Romans 8, chapter 7 says, Because the mind is set on the flesh, it is at enmity towards God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. These people, because of their sin, who saw John the Baptist and saw him pointing to Christ, these people who were in the darkness, they were not even able to recognize the light because of the depth of their sin. And it was cutting them off. Their sin was cutting them off from access to the Lamb. But there stands this man in the midst of this dark age who comprehends the light who sees that this is the Lamb and points people to Him, who's not wandering away in the darkness, stumbling towards the cliff, who is not sitting in His house, hoping against hope that death will not come in even though He has no blood of the Lamb. He knows the route to life. There's one man, John the Baptist, who sees this. Well, how is it that John the Baptist, out of all of these people in this narrative... All these Jewish people, how is it that he's the one who sees the Lamb, who understands? How is that possible? What, what did John the Baptist do to see this? Well, there's four things in our text this morning that describe to us how John the Baptist is able to perceive the Lamb. And we do well to pay attention to these four things because if we are able to practice these four things, we will behold Christ more. If you already see Christ, if you already believe in Him, then you're going to be able to see Him better. You're going to believe in Him more. If you don't yet believe in Christ and you do these things by the power of God, by the grace of God, you'll become a Christian, which means that the death that's hovering over our landscape will not come into your home. You will escape death itself. We live in a time where this is possibly more important than any other time in the world. Death is part of our culture. Many people call the culture that we live in a culture of death. It's a death where people murder babies and celebrate the murder. That is a culture of death. People celebrate the end of life. People in politics are pushing for the right to kill oneself through euthanasia. We celebrate uh, these things during Halloween where there's death and gore and blood and people celebrate it because we live in a culture of death. We live in an age where people are getting cancer at younger and younger ages and doctors don't know why. We live in an age since the world is connected that plagues can spread around the globe in a matter of days. We live in an age where countries have weapons that can wipe out entire nations, even the entire world, at the mere push of a button. We live in an age when technology is increasing so quickly that our computers are starting to become as intelligent as human beings. And their technology is being put into robots that can walk around and do whatever they want. We live in an age where the spirit of death ho hovers above us, yet if we have access to the Lamb, we need not fear. We can be in that age and be at perfect peace because of the Lamb of God. How do we see Him? Well, first in our text we see that John the Baptist accesses the Lamb. He sees the Lamb First and foremost, and this is probably the most important aspect, he sees the lamb 
through humility. Humility. We saw a couple weeks ago, starting in verse 19, these Jews come up to him and they say, Who are you? In verse 20 it says, He confessed, he didn't deny it, he confessed, I am not the Christ. I'm not the Messiah. I'm not the chosen one. I'm not the one that God has selected to lead you. I don't want to lead you, he says. So they pressed him, verse 21, are you Elijah? He says, I'm not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. And then they said to him, who are you so that you may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? And he answered, saying, I'm not the prophet, I'm not Elijah, I'm not the special one, I'm not the leader, I'm not the one who wants a lot of followers. All I am is a voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. I'm a voice, he says. My life is dedicated to pointing to Christ. That's radical humility. Verse 29 on the next day, he saw Jesus coming to him. He expresses this great humility, and the very next day, he sees Jesus. It's humility that unlocks for him the vision of Christ. Augustine, the great fourth century theologian, church father, somebody asked him, What's the core of Christianity? What's the way to Christ? Augustine said, this way is first, humility. Second, humility. Third, humility. And how I, however often you should ask me, I would say the same. If you should ask, and as often as you should ask, about the precepts of the Christian religion, my inclination would be to answer nothing but humility. Augustine understood that it's when we are humbled before the Lord, that's when true Christianity flourishes. That's when we truly see who Christ is. When we say, I'm not the leader, I don't want the followers, I don't want the attention, but it's about Christ. I'm a voice for Christ. That's when Christ reveals himself to us. There has never been a Christian, never, who became a Christian with a prideful heart. It is an impossibility to become a Christian with pride in your heart. It's simply impossible. The reason for that is that when we become a Christian, what do we do? We get on our hands and knees, we get on our face, and we say, I am a sinner, and I need salvation. I need to be saved from myself. I am incapable of saving myself. I need someone higher, better, more glorious than me. I need grace. I don't need works because my own works are like filthy rags. I need to, to be given something. I am begging of something from the Creator, the pure and perfect one. That is a statement of humility. And anything short of that statement is inadequate to become a Christian, to get saved. If we say, well, I'm pretty good and I made it halfway to heaven, I just need help getting the last halfway. If we say a lot of my works are pretty good, I just need Jesus to fill in some of the gaps. If we say I'm a little bit rough around the edges, if we say I have a few peccadilloes, if we say I try to live my life so that I don't need to ask for forgiveness, we are cutting ourselves off from the Lamb of God. The Lamb is only available to those who fall down before Him and say, I just want to be a voice. It's not about me. It's about Christ. I need him. Well, that's the first way John the Baptist sees him, through this radical humility. But then we see something amazing. This, to me, is just so astounding. Look at verse 31. It says, I did not know him, but so that he might be manifested to Israel, I came baptizing with water. Think about that statement for a second. I didn't know him, but so that he might be manifested to Israel, I came baptizing with water. Think about that for a second. How does that make any sense? How can you say, I don't know who this person is, but in order that everybody will know who he is, I am baptizing. Right? He's, he's saying, I don't know what's going on, but I want you to know what's going on. I don't know who he is, but I'm going to tell you who he is. How could that make any sense? 
This is amazing to me. I didn't know who he was. But so that he might be made known, manifested, I came baptizing with water. I didn't know him. And again, in verse 33, he repeats himself. And I did not know him. John the Baptist didn't know that Jesus was the Messiah at first. Before he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, he didn't know that it was Jesus. But he was doing something to manifest who Jesus is. And he's emphatic in this verse, in verse 31, it says, but so that he might be manifested to Israel. And then there's some words in the Greek that you can't see in the English. They don't translate them. It says, but so that he might be manifested to Israel. And then in the Greek it says, for this reason I came baptizing with water. He says twice, for this reason. But in English it doesn't make sense to say for this reason twice, so they delete one of them. But what's the point there? In the Greek it's emphatic saying, for this reason, for this reason. This is why I came, to manifest this person that I didn't yet know. Well, what does that reveal to us? The second way that we see who Christ is, the first is humility, the second is God's sovereignty. The second way that John the Baptist was enabled to see who God was was through the sovereignty of God that worked out John's life such that John was manifesting, was revealing, was presenting the person that he didn't even know yet. What does that say? God's in control. God is the one that writes the story of our lives. John the Baptist was preaching something he didn't even know yet. Why? Because God is sovereign. God is revealing Christ in John before John knows who Christ is. And when we begin to know Christ, that's the way it works. We just find ourselves all of a sudden knowing and doing and saying things about Jesus that seem to just come out of nowhere. We just find ourselves saying, I think I believe this and I'm not sure why. We start understanding things that we hadn't understood previously. Why? What is that? It's the sovereignty of God. Well, why is that necessary? Why must God sovereignly work this faith in Christ within us? Well, he must do that because of our sin. Our sin is so powerful that if God said, I'm going to give you everything you need to understand Christ, we would starve. Our sin is so powerful, if it were hunger, we could be locked in a grocery store and we'd starve to death. That's how cut off from the Lamb of God we are without God's grace. And so in the midst of our total depravity, God works this grace, this sovereign grace in our hearts so that we find ourselves like John the Baptist. I'm baptizing people, and I don't even know who the Messiah is. And then a few days later, I realized all that baptizing I did, that was preparing the way for the Messiah that I didn't even know yet. It's God's sovereign grace. It's a beautiful truth. Many Christians don't like the sovereign grace because they think it's unfair. But I love sovereign grace because it gives me hope because I know how deep my sin is. If God is not sovereign over my salvation, then I don't have any. Why? Because my sin is so deep. It runs in every fiber of my being. The very moment I have freedom, I use it to reject the Lamb to wander out into the darkness. But God in His grace is sovereign over me. And He saved me by His grace and grace alone. So that's the second way John sees the Messiah is through the sovereignty of God. Well, the third way is the Holy Spirit. We see in verse 32, it says, John bore witness saying, I have beheld the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven and He abided on Him. So this is where John really practically starts seeing this is who the Messiah is. He sees Jesus. He knew Jesus. He didn't know he was the Messiah yet. But then during the baptism, John saw the Spirit like a dove, not as a dove. It's not an actual dove. He says the Spirit like a dove, something he saw that some way resembled a dove, started to fall upon Christ. Now, what's interesting is the writer of this gospel, John the Evangelist, is probably the same writer of the book of Revelation, and he uses similar language all over Revelation. If you've been with us in the evenings, you'll 
hear John over and over again in Revelation say, this thing is like that thing. This thing is like this thing. He always uses the word like. It's never an actual representation, hardly ever. He says it's like this, it's like that. And the point there is that the thing he saw is so otherworldly, he can't perfectly translate it into human terms. There is no human thing that perfectly represents what John saw in Revelation and here when he saw the Spirit descending upon Christ. It was otherworldly, beautiful. It was like a dove. It was purity, it was grace, and it was remaining on Christ. And John says that when he saw this Spirit on Christ, that's what revealed to him this is the Messiah. And it's the same for us when we behold who Christ is. We are given power through the Holy Spirit to see that who Christ is, is glorious. He is the one who has the holiness of God. We, we think about Christ, we look to Christ, we read about Christ, and we say, he's perfect in every way. He's attractive to me. He draws me in. He fills my heart with great longing to know him and to be close to him and to worship him. What is that when you have that experience? It's you beholding the Holy Spirit on Christ. And we cannot come to Christ and enjoy the Lamb without this activity of the Spirit. And John goes on to say that this one who has the Spirit, in verse 33, the end of the verse, this is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. So not only does Christ have the Spirit, but Christ blesses us with the Spirit, which is amazing. And it's so amazing that we're going to spend a whole sermon just on that one phrase, the baptism of the Spirit. John's going to preach for us next week about the baptism of the Spirit. We don't have time to go into that today. But for today, the point is that when we behold Christ, it's through the Spirit. The Spirit reveals who Christ is. And then finally, the fourth way is the Word. In verse 33, it says, I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, the one upon whom you see the Spirit descending and abiding on him, this is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. So John says, not only did I see the Spirit, but I had the Word of God the Father confirming to me that this is the one. It was the Word of God the Father that confirmed what John was experiencing. All four of these points are important, but perhaps today, this is the most important point. Just this morning, I received an email from someone calling me to repent for a sermon that I preached here a while ago uh, entitled Jezebel in the CRC, and I named certain people who were in the CRC or near the CRC who were preaching uh, LGBTQ acceptance in terms of uh, it not being a sin. We accept LGBTQ people, but we reject the sin. But I named people who are accepting the sin, praising the sin. And someone reached out to me this morning, a fellow uh, pastor said, you need to repent for naming this person uh, and, and indicating that this person is against God's will and that God is against what this person is saying. Well, I think that's why the word is so central because we can debate till we're blue in the face about what Jesus says and would say and about who Jesus loves, but without the word of God, we have no leg to stand on. We don't know. We have no idea. Who is it that God accepts? Well, the word says that this is the one. Jesus Christ is the one. And Jesus Christ says, take up your cross and follow me. Jesus Christ says, he who does not hate father and mother is not worthy of me. Jesus stands in the book of Revelation with hair white like wool, with eyes like fire, with feet like burnished bronze, with a golden sash tied around him and a sword. And he looks at those who teach sexual immorality, Jezebel, and he says, stop, repent, or you will be destroyed. That's the word of God. That's who Christ is. Many people don't like that, but our job is not to knock the edges off of who Jesus is so that he fits in the peg of society so that people will say, I accept this version of Jesus. Our job is to look to the word. 
John the Baptist only knew who Christ was because of the Word. And if we do not look to the Word to see who Christ is, but instead we look to ourselves, we will refashion Christ into our own image, which means we will sever ourselves from the Lamb of God. And we will remain in the darkness. But Christ reveals himself to his children. He reveals himself amazingly as the Passover lamb. He was killed at the same time as the Passover lamb in John 19. His bones weren't broken just like the Passover lamb. He was brought into Jerusalem four days before his death, just like the Passover lamb was brought into the house four days before its death. Christ was without sinful blemish, just like the Passover lamb had to be without blemish. Christ was male, just like the Passover lamb had to be male. Both Christ and the Passover lamb were killed on the eve of Passover. Christ is the firstborn, the only begotten Son of God, just like the firstborn who had to die during the tenth plague in Egypt. Romans 8.29 says, Christ is the firstborn among many brothers. Christ died on a cross, just like the blood that had to be put on the doorposts of the Israelite houses. They had to put blood on the top, and they had to put blood on the sides. And as the blood dripped down from the top, it would form a cross, the same cross that Christ hung from. The death of Christ provides freedom from our sins, freedom from eternal death, freedom from the judgment, just like the death of the Passover lamb provided freedom for the Israelites to leave the bondage of Egypt. Even the very bread that was used during the Passover meal. They would eat the lamb, and then they had bread, special bread called matzah. And matzah had to be, according to the Old Testament, unleavened, which made it look like flesh. And the bread would be pierced, just like Isaiah 53 says, Christ was pierced. Everything about the lamb points us to Christ. Yet John the Baptist, he says, Behold the Lamb of God, not just for the Egyptians in Israel thousands of years ago, but behold the Lamb of God, verse 29, who takes away the sin of the world. This is who Christ is. He's the Passover Lamb that was pointed to in the Old Testament, but it's not just for Israel anymore, though it is for them, but it's for the whole world. The entire world can have access to this lamb who provides perfect peace, who provides eternal life. And John says that this lamb takes away the sins of the world. That's present tense. It could be translated, behold the lamb who is taking away the sins of the world. Many of us who are Christians, we think, well, I became a Christian because I made a profession of faith at some point in my life, but now Christ is kind of far from me. Now I'm kind of stuck in my sins. I kind of got brought in the door, but now I'm wandering around in the church not knowing if God loves me. Some of us think, well, God has saved others through Christ. He saved different types of people, but I'm too sinful. The things that I've done are too severe. Christ's death couldn't be for me. It has to only be for them. But this beautiful verse, this amazing statement, the most beautiful words ever uttered by human lips, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He continues to take away our sins. Present tense, He is taking away our sins. When we're saved by Christ, it's not a down payment that just gets left alone. It's not like He gives us a gift and then leaves but it's something that he gives us that grows exponentially. He continues to save us. I like, I had a pastor friend who was on a campus and people were evangelizing on this school campus and someone came up to him and said, you know, are you saved? Do you believe the gospel? Are you saved, mister? And this pastor friend of mine, he said, well, I am saved and I was saved and I'm gonna be saved. And this person who was evangelizing looked at him and said, are you a pastor? Because he figured, you know, no one who's 
of thinking in terms like that is not a Christian. This is kind of a technical thing. This is something that only pastors talk about, but it's true. We were saved by Christ, past tense. We are being saved by Christ, present tense, and we will be saved by Christ at the last day. He is carrying us through. He continues to be with us. He is taking away the sins of the world, and it's for all people. There is no one who is too far away from Christ to be saved by him. He saves to the uttermost. The Lamb of God takes away the sins of the world. Everyone. There is not a single sin that the blood of the Lamb will not atone for. Not one. The only sin that the blood can't atone for is the sin of rejecting the blood in the first place. No matter what it is anyone has ever done, the worst sin you could possibly imagine, if that person comes to Christ in humility and says, forgive me, I'm a sinner, that person will be saved. Why? Because the blood of the Lamb does atone for sin. Period. Well, that's the gospel, and that's what we're going to experience today in communion. It's a reminder of what Christ has done for us. And as we partake of this communion, I'm reminded of Martin Luther's first communion service. The first time he ever did communion, he preached the communion sermon okay. He was a little nervous. And then it came time to administer the elements, and he began to shake. And he stood there looking at the bread and the wine, and he started to to stumble over his words. And then he got to the point where he couldn't even speak. And then he went and sat down. And the church was silent and mystified as to what to do next. And they later asked Martin Luther, after the service had concluded, what happened? Why did you just stop? And he said, how could I, this unworthy man, this sinner, how could I even touch the very body and blood of Christ, the Lamb of God? He properly understood what communion is, that it's the meal from the Paschal Lamb, the one who has shed his blood, who was pierced for our transgressions, that one who paid the price for our sin so that death would pass over us and we might inherit eternal life. How precious is the Lamb? Well, this is what we get to experience. Let's pray and ask that the Lord would make us worthy to receive him. Lord, we know that we're unworthy in and of ourselves, but by your grace we can be cleansed and by your spirit we can be brought to a place where we receive the Paschal Lamb, where we receive Christ properly and in a worthy manner. So Lord, we ask that you would make us worthy by granting us humble hearts that acknowledge and understand the gravity of our sin and the majesty of the forgiveness of Christ, which was set down for us in the book of Exodus and prefigured before that in the book of Genesis and was fulfilled in the Gospels and the future perfection of that fulfillment is displayed for us in the book of Revelation. Help us to rejoice in the truth that we are experiencing this morning. 